Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where we interview entertainment pros about their careers and how they became successful in the industry. The secrets to their success here every week. Here's your host, Sean Ventura. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Ventura, and I just want to say subscribe to our YouTube page, like and share our Facebook page, and download at Apple and Google Podcasts. Our guest today is Jim Issa. He's a director, drummer, editor. He does so many things. He's got so many stories. It's going to be fun. Here we go. Okay, so let's get started. We're here today with Jim Issa. He is a director, producer, and a drummer. Uh, We worked together on a couple projects at Turner when I was an editor there, and he was directing some stuff, so we'll talk about that. He's got a long career with lots of different stuff, feature films and and theater and acting. So we're going to talk about that today. Thanks for doing this, Jim. This is awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, this is cool. Um, so let me just start with my first question, which is how did you know that you wanted to get into the uh, film and TV industry? Uh, I, I've always been a performer as a little kid. I can remember dressing up in like a cowboy outfit and singing Fever. <laughs> in my grandmother's fever in the morning. Yeah. I don't know why, but I can just remember like snapping and going back and forth and singing that song. Right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and I, and I just kind of always performed and I, and I, I was a drummer um, all through elementary school and high school and, and still to this day. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I would, thought I was going to stay more on the music side and got into... Um, I started at Georgia State as a music major, and then I switched to theater when a friend of mine convinced me to take an acting class in college. So I hadn't really, you know, done any acting professionally or classes or anything prior to my freshman year of college. Okay. Um, And from there, you know, I definitely got the bug and was in every play that I could possibly be in in college. I'm... um, I told a story recently of um, I auditioned for Evita. My my um, the school was doing Evita, and the the professor who was going to direct the show was like, you know, you'd be perfect for Shay. You're great. You got to come out. You got to do this audition. And I memorized the whole you know the whole album. I, I listened to it all, wow. every song and every word, every part. I got out there, and at the end of my audition, he was like, you know. Um, maybe musicals aren't for you. You should consider, we've got a comedy coming up in the spring. Why don't you do the comedy? And that was it. You know, I, um, you know, he was honest enough to tell me I can't sing, which I, I knew. Um, right. and then got into doing comedic theater, um, which led us to forming a uh, whole world theater back in 1994. Okay. What was that like? Uh, what was that, what was that theater like? Were you doing original plays or? So whole world theaters, it was, uh, founded as an improv comedy club. Um, a guy named David Webster came in from second city and he had taught some classes in Atlanta and he, uh, he said, you know, I'm thinking about moving to Atlanta and starting this theater company. Will you help me, you know, put it together? So, um, I was still a senior in college and then, you know, big in the theater there. So, you know, I helped recruit some people to sign up for the very first classes and he came in and, you know, started teaching these classes and the, and it, and it, the people that were in those very first classes kind of became the core acting group for this improv show. And, okay. it, um, and this is 94, the theater is still there. It's still going strong. Um, where is I, it? It's in uh, in Atlanta, in Midtown Atlanta, on Spring okay. Street. Uh, and we did uh, we did plays as well. We did long form improv. We kind of did everything, um, and realized we wanted you know we wanted to be on TV, um, um, and so we had this big plan of moving to LA and uh you know renting a theater there we you know me and uh, webster and, and another one of the actors had gone out and we'd scouted all these locations and thought we were going to move and and then i kind of had this idea of just like well, i don't want to move i want to stay here i know everybody here can't we just form uh can't we just shoot our own show right so i had um i was working as a pa more or less for a woman named fran burst who's kind of one of the founding Atlanta, Georgia film people. Um, 
Right. And, and I, I worked with Fran on a documentary. Does she mostly do documentaries or correct. does she do other stuff? Okay. Yeah, we were mostly doing documentaries and, you know, corporate work. And, and Fran was just kind of a legend in this town and everybody knew her. And I guess in 97, 98, you know, I, I asked her, can you help us put together a show? So she reached out to some different technicians and a guy named Jack Frost, who was head of like uh, Turner Studios or he was something over at Turner Studios. Jack mm-hmm. came in and we put together a crew and we found uh, somebody to help invest and bought all our own equipment. And we basically taught ourselves how to shoot our own TV show. Cool. Um, yeah. And it's kind of one of those uh, things where no one's going to give it to you. So we're just going to figure it out. And right. we did. And we, we sold our first show to turn herself and they launched the network, you know, with that, with that new show and kind of helped us all start our TV careers. And did you shoot it at Turner? No, we shot it at Whole World Theater. We, okay. we turned the small theater on Spring Street. We had four cameras. We had a switcher. We would, um, we would shoot the live improv show. And then in between live segments, uh, my day job was going out and shooting hidden camera spots with the cast. Okay. So we would go out. We'd shoot all these hidden camera spots during the weekend. I, you know, we would edit them together and we would air them on TVs in between the live sh- uh, the live scenes. Okay. So you'd get a live scene we'd shoot and then we'd air the, the hidden camera piece and then a live scene back and forth, you know, all in front of a live audience. And we did it. Oh, wow. We did five shows a week, you know? Um, and, um, I have a couple of questions, but the first one was shooting in front of a live audience. Did that mess with the audio at all? Did you have boom mics or did you have lav mics? How did you no, record the audio? We all wore labs. Okay. Um, we all, beat them up like crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this was a very physical group. Like right. we were all over the stage jumping and, and beating each other and, <laughs> you know, quick changes and everything. So, yeah, I mean, the audio was, you know, was pretty darn good for a, uh, you know, a small theater house that we just kind of did our own thing. We had, you know, a young up and coming audio guy who probably never, you know, barely had any professional work. And now right. he's, a guy named Jay Tyser, who I've seen traveling all over the world doing audio now. And it's like, you know, we all cut our teeth there. Right. Um, and we got good because we had to. You know, it was very yeah. competitive for us. And, and what was the name of the show on Turner South? Uh, it was called Last Hour Live. Okay. Um, because it was going to air 11 o'clock Saturday night or something like that. So, All right. So was, maybe that I got there in 2005 and... Worked on Bushwhacked and Southern Living Presents, but I don't remember. This was 97, 98, I think. Oh, okay. 99. So much when the thing, when it just first started. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, did you do some other stuff for Turner South or other TV <clears throat> shows after that? Or where do you go from there? Well, from there, we um, we took our, we cut a pilot together of our own sort of mixed and match media. And we shopped it around and uh, sold it to Castle Rock. So, okay. I mean, you know, we're kids. We're stupid, you know, little punks yeah. <laughs> with big egos. And, you know, right. you're sitting in the office of the president of Castle Rock, a guy named Glenn Padnick. Couldn't have been a nicer guy. He yeah. Just, you know, you hear, you know, Christopher Guest down the hall. You hear all these people. And you're just like, what am I doing here? How did you I know? get here? <laughs> this is the guy who put Seinfeld on TV. You know, right. and he's got... Uh, and, you know, he said, hey, you know, I love the show. We're going to shop it around. And so we did. And we, we took it to Fox. And um, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was like, you know, the first reality show TV network guys. And, um, anyway, he, you know, he bought it and we created a pilot for Fox. And, you know, they spent a ton of money and brought in a lot of big names to direct it and mm-hmm. showrunners and things like that. And it was terrible. Really? It was, it was what was awful. the name of it? Uh, I, I can't, it wasn't whole world theater. I, I'm trying to remember, but um, without saying any names, they brought in a showrunner who really just didn't get it. Okay. And um, it just became an awful mess. It was like if Carol Burnett was bad, and mixed with, any, I mean, it was just, it was just awful. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that was like 2000. And after that, we all just sort of dispersed. We decided that was it. You know, it's not going to get bigger than that. You're not going to make a half a million dollar pilot for Fox again. So we mm-hmm. all 
you know, we all just kind of went on our ways and half the actors uh, went off to L.A. and some to New York. And um, I stayed in Atlanta and thought, all right, well, you know, I've been working here in production. Let me see if I can't build something for myself here. Right. So for years, I was friends with an actor named Tony Shaloub. He was Monk, um, you know, and, and he was in Wings. I mean, he's been in Big Night. He's been in hundreds of movies. And Tony and I became friends through his sister, Jane, who was a school teacher in Atlanta. And, you know, he came to Atlanta and he saw some of our whole world shows. We actually drug him on stage to be on stage with us. And he performed. Um, cool. And then in 1999... My friends and I were over at Tony Shalhoub's house and Tony's wife and her sister were wanting Tony to direct a movie. And he was, um, hey, my wife wants to make a movie and she wants me to direct it. And, uh, you know, but I don't want to fund it. So, and so, you know, I was like, hold on, I have a perfect person. Um, so, you know, I connected Tony with an investor friend of mine and we raised money for a movie that called Made Up that Tony's wife, Brooke Adams, and her sister, Lynn Adams, mm -hmm. wrote. Um, but they needed to raise some money. So I said, you know what? I got this. Give me your phone. So I called my friend, Bob, who lived back in Atlanta. Bob's a, a big carpet mogul. And I, uh, I'm sitting across from Tony, you know, in this room. And I, and I grab the phone. I say, Bob, it's Jim. Hey, listen, I'm at Tony Shalhoub's house in L.A. When are you going to be in L.A. next? You know, he's like, I'll be there in a week. He said, oh, great. Get us a table at Spago's for 10 uh, for Saturday night. And I've got a perfect opportunity for you. I got to go. And I just hung up the phone. Mm -hmm. and Tony's like, what the hell was that? I was like, trust me. Give me 10 minutes. I'm going to call him back and I'm going to get your money for your movie. So sure enough, I call him back in 10 minutes and say, listen, Tony's going to direct this movie. They're looking for investors. I think you'd be perfect for this. If you're going to be in LA, let's have a big dinner. Let's have a good time. And if we play our cards right, we're going to get you to invest in and fund this movie. And sure enough, Bob flies out to LA, gets a dinner for 10 at Spago on us. And back in, you know, 99, that was like the hip place to right, be. It's a big place. So, you know, we're be. there at this big table and this is Tony and his wife, Brooke, who's a huge movie star and Bob. And then, you know, seven other actor friends of mine, just idiots, you know, all at this fancy dinner. And we're just causing so much ruckus in the place. It's <laughs> lots of laughter, you know, just like practically having food fights in this nice restaurant. And Tony and Brooke are trying to sell Bob on raising money for this movie. And, and they're giving him all this investment information and all this, you know, and Bob's just kind of like, yeah, you know, everybody knows you're not going to make money on an indie movie like that. And finally, I just stopped him and I said, Brooke, Tony, you guys have Academy Award tickets. You should take Bob to the Oscars this year. That would be great. <laughs> and his face lightens up and he's like, wait, you can, you can do that? And they're like, yes, of course. We have, you know, we have four tickets. Why don't you come with us? And he says, you know, well, I would love to. You know, that sounds great. And the very next day he signs with them, invests in this movie, funds the movie, all because... You know, he has money. He he doesn't need to make uh you know three percent more on his investment. Right. He wants to go to the Oscars with exactly. movie stars. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he went for the next five years that gave him tickets to go to the Academy Awards. And that was what he got out of it, you know, because nice. those are experiences. And that's how I became a movie producer, is basically by you know, connecting the dots and having it, you know, showing people what fun this industry can be right and that's you know that's what some people want out of it cool and you know so that was sort of my uh foray into producing movies i think it was like an associate producer or something on that yeah um and at that time i i was editing for a living um still doing some acting all right so moving on from there we do we get the the funding for that movie and the oscar stories which is very cool it's a good story um then do we go to the Editing rhymes movie. Uh, no, I did the. Um, I won the Forty Eight Hour Film Festival, and from that, okay. I got offered the Leanne Rhymes movie. Okay, do you want to talk about doing the Forty Eight Hour Film yeah, Festival? Yeah, that's a just... big deal. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, so I had been editing for some time, and I basically got my start editing when we were producing the Whole World Theater show, and the editor said, "Hey, I'm quitting. I'm leaving." I'll give you four hours and I'll teach you how to edit as best I can. And sure enough, that was it. You know, he, he gave me four hours of coaching and 
And from then on, I took over the edit position, <laughs> editing uh, an improv comedy show. Um, and that's, I just sort of cut my teeth in Final Cut Pro and, mm-hmm. and started a career by being a comedy editor, all because people knew about the show. They knew, you know, they, 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 they thought it was funny. They knew that I knew comedy and I could help put a story together. So, um, I got into editing that way and was doing it semi-professionally for some agencies, you know, the, the smaller stuff. Um, and then in 2002 and 2003, I acted in the 48 hour film festival okay um in a couple movies um 2002 in a movie called white bitch down which <laughs> won the 48 hour the, it won the national 48 hour film festival and then um 2003 i acted in another one um about the four horsemen of the apocalypse and then 2004 i directed um my film called moved and uh we ended up winning the atlanta 48-hour film festival and then went on and won the whole international 48-hour film festival wow uh which was big yeah um, you know it was back then it was like over 600 movies um and um uh, from there i got offered to direct this movie called good intentions and um you know we we spent a couple years developing the script and we shot a trailer for it to help raise the money and eventually, using that trailer, we were able to get, uh, let's see, Luke Perry, uh, Leanne Rimes, a woman named Elaine Hendricks, who's actually the, the lead in it. Mm-hmm. And then two of my favorite actors, a guy named John Grice and Jimmy Simpson, um, um, who played supporting parts, but are now huge stars. Right. <clears throat> and was there anything uh, in there about working with any of those actors or on the movie? <laughs> it was your first feature, right? <laughs> Yeah, that was my first feature. Um, and my gosh, you learn so much. I mean, we were shooting on film. It was all on 35 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you know, we scouted forever. It was um, 20, supposed to be a 27 shoot day. And then maybe five days into shooting, I got sat down in the producer's office and they said, look, we got to cut five days out of our shoot schedule. Oh. So we have to figure this out. Um, wow. And it was, you know, I mean, it was hot. It was 105 degrees in summer in and you Madison, shot in Atlanta. Georgia. Okay. Yeah, it was shot in Rutledge, in Madison, and New Bern, Okay. Um, all 20, 30 minutes outside the city. But, uh, you know, a fantastic experience working some real professional actors. I mean, it was amazing when Luke Perry would just, you know, he didn't want to rehearse. He didn't want to, he didn't want to sit down and do any sort of read throughs or anything mm. like that. And, my God, the guy knew exactly where his face needed to be to be in the light in every scene, no matter where we were. <laughs> he knew where the lens was every single time. Wow. You know, he could, he, he would help us in blocking just by knowing how to maneuver his way through a set. Right. Um, and, you know, versus when you're doing commercials and you're, you, you know, the director, typically I'm, I'm, I'm sort of calculating every micro move that every person is doing to work for the camera. <clears throat> and it was, it was a pleasure having somebody with his experience really just be able to work with you. And it became a, you know, a bit of a dance. Right. And it, it was 90210. Was that over by then or was he still shooting that or? No, 90210 was very over by this point. Okay. So he had, um, you know, he'd probably moved on from that. 10 years or so. Mm. Um, okay. Where do we go after good intentions? Uh, so from there it was a uh, commercial world, you know, okay. um, at that point I was selling myself as a, you know, a, a movie and commercial storyteller. Um, I was doing lots of work um, with some, you know, major national uh, and international ad agencies directing commercials, doing long form, you know, a little bit of everything, um, right. still based out of Atlanta, but, you know, I had traveling to LA quite a bit and shooting out there. Um, we did a project together. We did the, the Alliance theater piece. Yes. It was one of the great pieces on my, you know, I love that, that piece. Yeah, it was great. Uh, and, and I just have to say as an editor, cause you were the director and I was the editor, like to, I mean, you can describe it, but, um, everybody's standing still and the camera's moving through it. Uh, through the theater, um, I d- 
didn't have to really edit at all because <laughs> you did everything the camera. Well, it was like, let's lay it down and put some music on it. So, um, yeah, the concept was, you know, this, um, the Alliance Theater is a, is a you know, a, 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 a regional theater here in Atlanta. They're doing, uh, they're winning international play awards. They're a theater mm-hmm. awards. They're a huge, huge force in the theater world. But people don't really know about it. So they, we wanted to make a promo video for them. Um, and the concept was this actor's on stage and, and everybody freezes and he comes to life and he sort of guides you through the stage, through all the backstage components of the theater world, the, the education department, everything. And then it comes back on stage and it all comes back to life together with everybody frozen. But that's not how it was written. It was written to be a guy in a black box sort of talking to you while all these graphics popped up on oh, screen. Okay. So it was it wasn't written like that. And we were in casting um, and it was Jody Feldman, who's the the producer and the creative and the casting director for the Alliance. Okay. We're sitting together and halfway through the casting session I said, can we just pause this for a second? And I turned to her and said, look, I've got an idea. It has nothing to do with what we've been casting so far, but <laughs> Tell me if you'll go with this. And I pitched her on the whole concept of everybody freezing and all this stuff. And she's like, I love it. Let's do it. But the budget hasn't changed. So if Mm. you can do all that for the same budget that you were going to do this person in a black box with graphics jumping all over the place, then great. So we called in a lot of favors. I mean, this is, you know, this is a huge Steadicam shoot. Um, Right. And we did it. You know, we pulled it off all in one day and it was beautiful. And the camera work is fantastic and the actors are fantastic. And, you know, it's just kind of what happens when you decide, look, we're we're all going to take a hit financially, but we're going to create something that's awesome. Right. And it, you know, and it was a huge fundraising video for the Alliance. And I, you know, and uh, I happened to serve on the, um, you know, serve on a board at the Alliance Theater, whatever, 10 years later. Uh, and they still, st- people still remember that video. I mean, it was, right. um, it was cool. It was fun. Yeah, it was a great video. I think it won some awards too, won like sure. a telly or something. But, but was this, am I imagining this or did it happen? Was there some discussions once you decided you wanted to do this that there was going to be like special effects yeah. or getting flame involved? Because I remember yeah. like people saying, Oh, we'll do it like this movie did it and and shoot it with these cameras and circular cameras like the Matrix. But you were just like, no, we're going to do it all on yeah. camera and everybody's just going to stand still. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't know how to do that stuff. Look, but I'm a, were I'm a, they discussing that? Were, of were you? Okay. So some yeah, people. No, all that, you know, we had all these effects planned out for stuff frozen in air and stuff coming mm-hmm. to life. And, you know, like we had, we had all those things planned out or we were, you know, trying to get talked into all that stuff. Cause you know, you had Turner studios backing this whole thing and right. you've got some of the best post production people in the world all telling me that we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And I'm just like, but we can also just get everybody to stand still. Right. <laughs> and um, make it simple. Yeah. And we, you know, and, and I had to sort of give people, uh, activities or, you know, stuff to pull on so you can see the tension in their bodies. And you'll notice like everybody in the frozen state has a purpose. They're mm-hmm. not just standing there. They're doing something and they're in the middle of something that just time stopped. So right. their muscles are flexed and their eyes are intentional, you know? So, it, mm-hmm. so I think that's what makes the difference than just seeing people standing there. And, you know, we made some little fake rigs and we, um, there was maybe two shots that were, there was like a piece of paper floating in air mm. that we did in flame because we get a, they're like, you're going to afford two special effects. So <laughs> a piece of paper and a hat or a cane, right. I think were the two things. So flash forward, uh, you know, 2015, um, I, uh, got a call from a producer friend of mine in Boston, a guy named Mark Denadia, who I actually worked on, uh, made up with Tony Shalhoub and Brooke Adams with back in 2000. Uh, he, he called me out of the blue and said, Hey, you know, um, he got a call from Mar Vista entertainment, which is a big distribution company. Um, they're looking for female driven thrillers. And he said, you know, I've got you greenlit. I've already showed them some of your work. And they said that if we can come up with a female driven thriller at this price point, then, uh, we'll, we can be greenlit to shoot this year. So all I had, you know, so, okay, well, I came up with, they said, he's, you know, write three ideas down of what you should come up with, what this should be. And I came up with two. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we pitched them. They liked one of them. They said, okay, we approve that. You know, here's money, write a script. So we brought a script writer on and 
she wrote a treatment. Okay, we approve that. Let's go to the next step and wrote the, wrote the feature. And within four months of getting this call, I was in Boston scouting for this movie that we were shooting. And sure enough, I mean, hmm. it went fast, fast, fast. It was written, it was concepted, written, cast, funded, all within five months of that initial call. And we were filming, um, the funny thing is we were filming in, in Boston and right. we had five weeks on the ground there. And of those five weeks, we had five blizzards. This is the winter of 2015 <laughs> where, you know, and you look at my location scouting photos and I'm standing in four inches of snow, you know, and then you go back mm. to film it and they're like, hey, boss, where you want to shoot the scene? I'm like, well, look at the, you know, we're, we're, look at the scout photos out in the front yard. I'm like, boss, there's six feet of snow out there. How are we going to film there? <laughs> like, okay, we got to, you know, we had to make some changes. And it was, mm -hmm. it was, I'll say this, that uh, we shot in 14 days. We shot an entire movie in 14 days in Boston. Wow. Uh, every Crazy. day was 12 hours. We didn't go a minute of overtime. And there was not one day through all five blizzards was anybody ever late to set. I mean, this, this crew was wow. unbelievable how efficient and smart and safe. And, you know, they they knew how to get there and they knew how to deal with all the, the, the weather complications. And, and it was just a fantastic experience. And mm -hmm. I worked with a woman named Kate Ashfield, who um, uh, Kate was in Shaun of the Dead. I guess that's what she's most famous for. Okay. Um, and then uh, several other great actors in this movie. And it was um, funny. Yeah, it was a fun trailer. I watched the trailer on IMDb and uh, I was like, oh, well, I'll tell you to kill everybody. <laughs> well, what's interesting is that they, um, <laughs> so they edited the trailer and sold that before we were done really filming and finishing the movie. Mm. Um, and we got done making the movie and uh, the producer's like, hey, you know, we've got an issue here. This movie's only 85 minutes long and we promised them 90, 91. Right. So we had to write an opening scene. Uh, we, you know, we came up with like, what's our solve for this? So we created a sort of a, pre a preface scene and mm. shot it at my neighbor's house. I put my neighbors in it. I hired a couple of local Atlanta actors and we filmed it literally just everybody was getting ready at my house and shooting in my neighbor's front yard and on their front porch. And, wow. you know, it's like, hey, neighbors, how would you like to be dead people in, in a movie? Um, but, you know, it was, uh, you never have a too short of a movie. I mean, it's always like way too long winded and way right. too long. And, um, I actually think the reason for that is our lead character, our lead actress spoke really fast. And I oh, honestly okay. think that affected the length of the movie. And I loved her tempo. It was great for the role, but you know, it, it played a lot faster than it, than, uh, than it should have. But it just shows you how resourceful you have to be when you make movies because it's it, it's not all like glamour and oh, yeah. people sitting around in these trailers for – that's just the huge budget stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And this was, you know, literally the producers are like, you, know, you got, you know, $2,000 or some crazy small number to shoot this opening scene. So, you know, again, you're asking your neighbors, do you want to be in a movie? And you're getting local <laughs> actors here who are both – Just make it happen. Yeah. yeah. You just make it happen. And um I remember calling the uh, DP up and Steadicam operator and I'm like, hey, you know, how, how'd you like to come do this for $500 or whatever it might have been? Mm -hmm. And I also need all your equipment and can you bring some lights and your Steadicam rig and what else you got? So, you know, but yeah, I, I think that being an Atlanta director and being loyal and faithful to my crews and to my, you know, team members for years and years and years, you know, you, you don't feel bad asking people for favors at some point because they know that you're going to be loyal to them and it's not going to be one of those, Hey, I'll get you on the next one type of situations. It actually yeah, is, when it's a big you know? budget thing or commercial that has a budget, yeah. you'll hire them again. Sure. Yeah. So loyalty, loyalty is good. Okay. So from there mm -hmm. you go to, um, commercial spots. Well, from there, so this is agency. Yeah, stuff. So, so after, after doing this low budget movie, um, I got an offer to come on staff at BBDO, which is um, one of the biggest ad agencies in the world, to be right. on staff director and producer. Um, and sure enough, after spending you know three months doing a low budget movie, 
yes, a salary with insurance and all the benefits and everything. Sounds mm-hmm. wonderful. So I did. So I went on staff for two years at BBDO. I directed over 50 commercials in the first 18 months I was there. Um, did major campaigns for, you know, Toys R Us, for Sanderson Farms Chicken, for, you know, a lot of national companies. So, Right. I saw Home Depot and, and other stuff. Obviously, bigger budgets for yeah. a very short amount of time, 30, 60 seconds. I worked at Mechanics in New York, yeah. so I saw a lot of commercials. Yeah. And, and, you know, you're being on staff, director and editor, you know, you had it was you had the benefit of being able to brainstorm with the creative team for weeks as opposed to when you're a freelance director. It's like, you know, you get one day of shooting, mm-hmm. you get one day of casting and you get, you know, a couple hours on the phone with me and that's it. So it really became a huge plus to, to be able to just get into the weeds and, and talk like real people with the creative teams and try to figure out what is the point and how is the best way we can, you know, get the best performances and the best shoot out of this budget. Um, so uh, very eye opening for me, and I think for a lot of the people over at BBDO. And uh, from there, I got uh, recruited to go over to another agency in Atlanta called Twenty Two Squared, and that's where I head up the in house production arm of the of the agency, Twenty Two Pictures. And you know that was a real joy to have a team of producers and editors, and you know huge clients like the Home Depot. Um, uh, Baskin Robbins and, um, you know, a few other just major national brands where you get to dig in and you're a part of the creative process now, which is very different than just being a director for hire. So now I've left 22 squared and I've kind of doing this on my own where I've created a in-house production company that can work with different agencies and clients around the world. Um, the idea of production first model, which we developed over at 22, where it's, you know, bring us in from day one. Don't treat us like vendors. Let us be partners Mm. to the creative process so that, you know, so that I'm, I'm, I'm giving you options from day one on how to shoot your idea the best rather than you've spent three months developing and selling it to the client. And now you're going out to different production companies and having them bid. And everybody's telling you this, this concept is too expensive. It can't be done. So, you know, this model now works with the creative team from day one and we just create guardrails. We're like, yes, we can do that scene. Just do it, you know, in the living room instead of in this room and do it this way instead of that so that everybody stays satisfied. And it really puts as much production value on screen as possible without sacrificing the creative process. Um, And I'm, you know, doing that on my own, uh, doing it, bringing in different, you know, freelance creative teams and production people. Uh, currently we are in the middle of uh, COVID crisis. So all that has mm-hmm. been put on pause. Uh, I've um, recently um, unearthed some old scripts that uh, me and some partners had optioned years ago and revamping those. And our goal is to get those scripts ready to go and get funding in place and, and uh, bring those movies to life as soon as we're all able to get up and shooting again. And can you, can Jim, can you just talk briefly about, because some people would be very, very interested, uh, with independent movies, the funding and the fundraising, is there one way to do it or is there several ways to do it? How did, how did you get involved with that or does someone else take care of that for you? Um, I, so raising money for indie movies is, um, I mean, it is all over the place. There are so mm. many ways to do that. I, you know, I, I have friends of mine who made a hit movie for $80,000, you know, 15, 10 years ago. Like it, they, you know, it, it was, and it all came from one person's dad, you know, the, the, right. um, the last movie, Let's see. The last movie I raised money for, you know, we put on events at people's houses and we, okay. you know, we brought in either, you know, I would put together a little sizzle video. The producers would come in. Sometimes you bring in the lead actor. If you already have somebody signed, you bring in, um, you know, producers who've done other things who are going to be your partners and, and they have bring in some cachet with them and, and you host it right. at somebody's house, an aunt's house, a friend's house, somebody who wants to see you succeed and they bring their, their wealthy friends over to hear your, your pitch. And right. 
you know, you do it two or three or four times and one person latches on and they give you some seed money and you use that seed money to raise more money. And hopefully it, um, you know, that leads to finally funding a movie. Um, and, and, you know, there are being in Georgia, we have tax credits. You can pre sell right. tax credits to raise some money. You can sell your foreign distribution to raise some money. So, right. there, you know, there are lots of ways. I think the smartest thing to do is attach yourself to somebody who's done this multiple times and do the mm. work for them. Just take their advice, listen to what they have to say is how they've done it before and just, you know, just sort of grow and learn from them. And that's what I've done is, you know, I've partnered up with some of my, my producing friends up in Boston and, you know, we've done two movies together. We've raised money for another couple movies and we're raising money and, and getting this movie ready now. So it, 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 you just, you need a seed and you need to be so enthusiastic about it that you would comfortably talk this over with anybody and everybody that you could possibly meet. And you have to believe right. it, you know, if, yeah. if you wouldn't ask your parents for it and I don't recommend you asking your parents for it, but if you wouldn't <laughs> ask your parents for it, then you probably don't trust it enough. Does that make sense? Right. Right. Yeah, no, that makes <laughs> sense. And then let's just wrap it up with, um, being a director for young directors out there who are making shorts and entering festivals and, <laughs> They want to be an agency director or they want to direct feature films. What would your advice to them be? So it, advice to directors is, and it's different for different people. I, I fortunately, I was an actor and then an editor and a producer before I became a director. So I knew how to speak to actors. I knew what it took to edit a piece to get it done. And I learned the financial responsibility of having my own company to, to, you know, to know what the producer's jobs were. So, mm. I, you know, I think there's, there's certainly a hierarchy in the commercial world where you start off usually as a PA of some sort and kind of work your way right. up the ranks to different departments. Um, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that people should edit, uh, they should edit if they're planning on getting into directing and storytelling. Hmm. Um, okay. You know, I, my daughter is 10. She knows how to edit in fi uh, Final Cut. She knows how to edit in Premiere. She knows how to edit. You know, she's 10 years old because, right, right. Um, because they're cool. available now. Like, it's right. 20 bucks a month or $29 a month. You can do it. Yeah. And get some photos, download some stock footage, take some old videos from somebody and just put it together and tell a story and know what mm. it takes to get from the beginning to the end. Know what right. sort of insert shots you need to transition from one scene to another. Learn timing, play music in the background. You know, being a drummer all my life, everything I shoot has a tempo. You know, when I'm on mm. set, you'll see my head bobbing the whole time because I know the tempo of the scene. And when I'm editing, I know when a piece is running long because I feel the music hasn't changed. Um, mm. So uh, for young directors, I, I really encourage you to edit your own stories, edit anything, stop motion, iPhone videos, whatever it takes, just right. to understand tempo and tone. <clears throat> and then um, really win it on paper. You know, the whole idea of when the producer kicked me out of the room for good intentions and cut the scene down, like, golly, we could have saved so much time and money had we really done that with the script before right. we shot yeah. it. Uh, I met yeah. with a, that makes sense. a young, you know, uh, wannabe uh, director <clears throat> recently. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm going to ask some friends to come out and do this shoot. And I was like, well, what's the script? He goes, you know, I'm going to write a rough structure, story structure. And then, you know, we're going to kind of play with that. And I was like, well, this is your first film. I was like, so you're expecting people to come out and work for free on your short on something that you're not sure is even really right, you know? <laughs> um, I said, I, I said, I'll come out and work for free on your film in whatever position you want if I believe the script is great. And until your script is great, you you don't really, I don't really feel like you have the liberty to just ask professionals to come out and give donate their time yeah, for you. I agree. Um, and so you, you know, you have to really believe it and love it. And so that when other people read it, they go, I love this. I will, not only will I give you a day of my time, I'll, I'll ask my friends to come out with it, with me and we'll bring some equipment right. with us because we think it's great. 
That's great advice, man. I agree with all of it. And uh, thank you so much for doing this, Jim. This has been very insightful, cool stories. I definitely um, loved hearing about, especially the the independent features, because I've always wanted to do a feature and I haven't yet. Hopefully I will someday. Awesome, man. Thanks so much. Have a great Uh, day. I'll talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Lights, Camera Pro podcast, where entertainment pros talk about how they made their dream into a career. Subscribe to our YouTube page, like and share our Facebook page, and download at Apple and Google Podcasts. Thanks to Bob Jurgens for the rock and VO and Joseph McDade for the music. Next week, we have a great guest. It's Justin O'Neill Miller. He works on huge movies. He's worked on the show The Walking Dead. He's working on The Rock's new movie. He's working on uh, Christopher Nolan's new movie, Tenant. He's got so much going on. It's going to be fun. Tune in next week. 